I want you to remember that no holographic bastard won a war by dying for his country. The doctor is here to raise crew morale with this series of hollow photos, like regular photos, but really, really big. These are the many inspiring images of his trip through the Delta Quadrant, preserved for posterity. And when your grandson asks what you did in the great Delta Quadrant, you won't have to say, I shoveled shit in Louisiana. Here's where we see a rare moment of sanity. Knowing that the doctor's photo essay is going to run two hours, Janeway ordered Chakotay to issue a yellow alert after just 30 minutes. But when Harry points out it's already been an hour, Chakotay says to hell with Janeway's orders. They can watch the entire exhibition. Harry offers his best attempt at a smile, as, for Harry, this is as close as he gets to being happy, knowing that for a brief time he'll be spared the captain's constant wrath. Meanwhile, the doctor shows us what a Vulcan testicle looks like. If you're curious, this is what a Vulcan pussy looks like. As Janeway contemplates Chakotay's punishment, Definitely grounds for court-martial. We see Torres and Perez continuing their tour of boredom by going to see Neelix. It reaches critical mass and the ship starts shaking like crazy, so everyone runs to their stations as an energy wave passes over the ship. After it's done, Harry finds out there's a data file that's now in their systems and just opens it. Yeah, try that the next time you're on the web and it just decides to download something onto your computer. See what happens. Congratulations. You are now the owner of 500,000 shares of Fireflies Incorporated. The file starts making sounds like an angry monkey trying to eat a vibrator. They trace it back to the source, a damaged ship, so Janeway orders the one occupant to be beamed to sickbay so the doctor can incapacitate it with his hollow essay. Well, the doctor's completely flummoxed because, for once, the alien is actually alien, as opposed to a guy with a funny forehead. And when Bolana shows up, things get worse. See, she was so concerned about how this whole scene was blocked out by the director, she just got too close to the creature, and it leaps from the bed and starts giving her a Class 5 Starfleet hickey. Janeway quickly grabs the medical phaser to sort this out, but the doctor stops her to make sure Torres doesn't accidentally get hurt. Though, when Janeway has a phaser, no one is accidentally hurt. Harry tries to beam it away, but for some strange reason, can't. So you beamed it to sickbay, but suddenly can't lock on to beam it away from sickbay. Of course, it must now be emitting some electro-plot device field, or, or maybe Harry's console is flooded with some more alien viruses than a Ryzen hostel. By the time Harry has his stuff sorted out, the creature is drilled into her and is using her lungs to stay alive, so it can't be beamed out now without taking part of her with it. The doctor says the only way to work this out is for him to start studying exobiology. There's only so much room in his hollow matrix for medical data, especially when you factor in all the space taken up by opera and taking hollow photos. Janeway says that instead of that, they should use the exobiology files and the biography of an existing exobiologist to create a consultant hologram for the doctor. Chromo Set is his name, and he's a Cardassian. Have you mentioned to anyone else that this guy's a Cardassian? What difference does it make? Maybe you haven't heard. They're not exactly the friendliest folks in the galaxy. I don't care if he's the nastiest man who ever lived, as long as he can help us save Balana. After a few false starts, they get him up and running, which is interesting because Harry and Tom's previous efforts to create a temporary EMH bottomed out under similar circumstances before. Must be because he hadn't used that recursive algorithm. Those things can sort anything out. Crow comes online and is immediately very polite and outgoing and instantly demonstrates an understanding of the entire situation that shows Taurus is in capable hands. Naturally, with such obvious competence on display, things are about five seconds away from going to shit. Meanwhile, Janeway has decided it'd be easier to crack the alien's message by taking the tones and turning them into color forms fun. Chakotay thinks this doesn't look terribly helpful for cracking the code, so he suggests getting info from the alien's ship to try to help. Since Torres is in a coma, I guess we'll have to settle for someone with a photographic memory and the experience of the Borg Collective over someone with anger issues who got her foot stuck in a plasma injector. This whiny little bastard is a Bajoran Maquis, Tabor, and the two of them round out their overall demonstration of awesomeness by trying to download the alien database and accidentally destroying the ship. Oops! At the other end of the spectrum, Krell works out the likely cause and nature of the attack, and the Doctor's quite impressed with his new friend. They figure if they're going to work this out, they'll need access to Krell's lab, which they can reproduce if he describes it. Except his memories are all the products of the ship computer, so why would they need to do such a tedious thing as have him describe it instead of just using the blueprints in its own system? Torres wakes up just long enough to show that the Maquis thing for her isn't just a cause, but a case of out-and-out -out racism, which is always nice to see in our heroes. She thinks all Cardassians are cold-blooded killers and wants nothing to do with him. 
Meanwhile, Krell demonstrates his evil by talking about how pointless he thought the Bajoran occupation was, even while the doctor praises his cure for some plague that broke out. He even invites Krell on a mandate to listen to some opera. Yes, there's nothing ominous about all this at all. Why don't we get started with a good old-fashioned vivisection? Things start to take a more unsettling turn as Krell proposes a procedure that should save Torres, but likely will kill the alien, even though it's a sentient life form. As he and the doctor debate whether they should continue to search for another procedure that could save both, Krell destabilizes and goes offline. As Harry and Whiny Bajoran work to restore him, Torres grumbles about how much she despises him for being a cardi, and that there will be problems if the doctor tries to keep him permanently, apparently because she's not alone in her blind hatred of Cardassians. Unfortunately, Krell doesn't do a good job of proving them wrong. Krell comes back online, and in response to his cheerful greeting, the Bajoran guy is shocked, because Krell also happens to be a mass murderer, including the Bajoran's own grandfather and brother. <laughs> it's a small galaxy. Tabor lays out all the horrible things Krell did, and says that the disease he cured was researched by deliberately infecting hundreds of Bajorans and experimenting on them. One common problem I've often had with Star Trek is that they'll take a historic event and twist it so it becomes completely one-sided, that an event with multiple sides and issues to it becomes crystal clear, this is right and there is no room for argument. This episode actually manages the reverse of that. It's been said that Krell is based upon Nazi scientist uh, Dr. Mengele, who worked in a concentration camp experimenting on Jews and gypsies. He blinded people so he could study how they adapted. Exposed them to polytrinic acid just to see how long it would take for their skin to heal. <sighs> this would be Mangala on a very, very good day. If you enjoy sleeping at night, you don't want to know what a bad day was. He's one of those people you pray are insane, because it's horrifying to think that a member of the human race could do such as him with a sane mind. When the ethics of using Nazi research comes up for discussion, rest assured that none of it has to do with that sick, sick, bastard, whose own colleague burned the research notes sent to him because they were unscientifically conducted and completely pointless. It was just a man satisfying morbid curiosity. The kind of Nazi science that's discussed are things such as data on exposure to extreme cold for long periods to determine the best means to rewarm a person, which many agree was scientifically conducted even though obviously morally bankrupt. I mean, obviously, I shouldn't even have to say that, but Anyway, that had nothing to do with Mengele. That's why I say this episode actually manages to blur the issue. Krell is basically a sick bastard like Mengele was, but with the twist that he actually did real science while doing it. Horrible, disgusting science, but still science, leaving us with an actual dilemma. Do we or don't we use his expertise to save Torres, knowing that his knowledge is the result of so much sadism or apathy? Does the doctor still stand by his earlier statement that he doesn't care if Krell is the nastiest man who ever lived? Torres makes the point clear. She doesn't want him to work on her, no matter how much Paris tries to convince her otherwise. Jerry Taylor does some rather interesting things with this. First, the doctor brings the issue up to Krell, who says whatever his real-life counterpart did has no bearing on the fact that the information within the system is factually true and can save Torres' life. The Bajoran in the following scene argues with Chakotay about how evil it is to use tainted data. Both sides of the issue are given the chance to present their arguments equally before the episode continues, and as written are both very compelling. The question that emerges is, would the victims be glad their deaths could ultimately save the lives of others, or would they hate the exploitation of their suffering? Paris and Chakotay start going at it in the magic meeting room when Janeway steps in. The only issue is whether or not Torres can be saved. What about the morality of it? The ethics? If we use this, we justify doing evil things in the name of research. I'm still not seeing where you're going with this. Okay, joking aside, this, folks, is the Janeway the show needed. It may have taken till her final season, but Jerry Taylor finally puts her out there exactly right. She has a genuine problem with only two choices, no third way out, and which answer is right is going to vary from one person to the next. And it's something that must be decided right here, right now. There's no hand-wringing, no posturing, just a simple declaration of her way of thinking. The well-being of Torres, their chief engineer on a ship far from home, on a vessel that's already lost too many experienced people, has to be their top priority. So she's going to authorize the procedure with the Krell Holograms assistance. 
Now, I'm not exactly happy that she's going to once again decide to defy the wishes of the patient, especially after that incident with Tuvix, though you can be a bit more forgiving if she's defying a patient's wishes to save their life rather than end it. But I do admit I like the way the scene was handled. Janeway doesn't just stomp in, act like she knows everything, and that everyone who disagrees is naive, and order people to do something that's obviously stupid. Instead, she addresses the problem like someone who knows that it's lose-lose, but that a decision has to be made, and maybe it's the wrong one, but there it is, and she's going to take ownership of it. If it's a mistake, and her actions indicate she realizes it might very well be, she's going to take full responsibility for it. You know, it's actually funny, now that I think of Tuvix, of a comment made that Janeway was right because of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. That is, after all, what Krell did, didn't it? Sacrifice some so that many more could be saved in the long run? As more of the aliens arrive, whom they can't understand either, the procedure causes friction between Krell and the Doctor. Krell's process is likely to kill it, while the Doctor thinks his might save both. But while Krell may seem heartless, he's not sadistic. When the doctor's procedure starts working, he immediately starts devising ways to ensure that it can survive without needing to suck on Tora's liver. With the alien stabilized, it's beamed back to its people, which gargle at them in appreciation. Afterwards, the doctor discusses Krell with Janeway, and she decides that, since he's the one who's going to have to make the medical decisions, it should be up to him to decide what's done with Krell. Before that, she checks in with Torres, who's extremely pissed at her over what she did, but disappointingly, there's not going to be any lasting ramifications over it. Just the magic reset button. Krell, however, is very pleased at what they accomplished, and is already working on a paper for it. The Doctor, however, can't continue to use ethically questionable data again, even though that's what saved Torres' life, and when Krell points that out to him, the Doctor has no answer except to delete him. The post-episode follow-up. Stupid Neelix moment is him acting like the Doctor's stories are boring when he won't stop inflicting his Talaxian proverbs and tales on us. Final score for Nothing Human is 7 out of 10. As one person described the episode, it was a good idea, it was just on the wrong show. The fact Krell is simply a simulation of the real man means so much of it could be avoided just by tweaking things here and there, like, say, not having the face of a Cardassian on a ship full of people who've waged war against them. I think there's a lot of potential with the Krell character that could have been used over the course of the season, you know, just every so often, like Suter was with Basics, that could have led to some kind of payoff in the series finale, maybe some kind of a tipping point. But alas, it wasn't. I'm afraid.